basic stuff tonight the anger of God we started that last week we'll pick it up again this week now this is just a real simple simple thing here <clears throat> first Timothy chapter 4 First Timothy 4, verse 1 and 2. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly. What's that mean? <laughs> expressly. He's dogmatic. Specifically. Specifically, that's right. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly, that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, Think it's the latter times yet? We're there. Lots of people are departing from the faith. Doesn't mean they lose their salvation. It means they walk away from biblical principles. Here's how it happens. Giving heed to seducing spirits. They didn't set out to walk away from Christianity. They were seduced into it. It's tricky. As a Christian, you have to be very vigilant and aware of what's going on because you've got two things after you. God is after you and the devil's after you. You're going to follow one or the other. Look at Eve. Uh, seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. That's where it ends up. They seduce you until before you know it, you're following the doctrines of devils. Now, you know that's wrong. They would have known that's wrong in the beginning, but they got seduced into it. Before they knew it, they woke up and they were following the devil. I've got some practical experience with this. I know people following doctrines of the devil. They didn't start out that way. Verse 2, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. They don't know what right and wrong is anymore. The conscience is no longer working. The thing that's supposed to tell you, hey, something's not right about this, he's off. It's not working anymore. They've told it to shut up so many times it no longer speaks. Seared. They're liars. If That's a telltale thing. If a person cannot speak the truth, they've got a spiritual problem. It's not a human problem. It's not a... a um, a sickness, it's not a disease, you know, it's not some clinical thing we can slap a, a, a scientific name to. It's spiritual, lying, it's of the devil. Let's go back to the beginning of this, Genesis 3, verse 13. Genesis 3, verse 13. And the Lord God said unto the woman, this is after they ate the fruit they were not supposed to in the garden. What is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. Okay, she finally got around to admitting it. I did eat. But she's got to get that finger pointing first. It's the serpent's fault. You know what? She still pays. If you get seduced, you know whose fault it is? Yours. That seems harsh, but I'm not saying it. God is. That's just the way it is. Don't be seduced. He's given you all the information on the front end so you'll not be seduced. So if you're seduced, that's your fault. You closed your eyes and blocked your ears so you wouldn't know. Uh, 2 Thessalonians. 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 9. It says, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with power and signs and lying wonders. So, lying wonders. Everybody wants a miracle. It starts out in the church. They want to see a miracle. Can you heal somebody? Can you make this grow, leg grow longer? Can you? It's one thing after the next. Okay, how do you know that's God not doing it and not the devil? He does it. The verse says he does it right there. Lying wonders. 
and with all deceivableness, that's that seducing, deceivableness of unrighteousness. If something is not righteous, count on it, there's a deception in it. It's done on purpose to deceive you. Uh, in them that perish. Okay, these people who are deceived, their end is to perish. Now usually perish means go to hell. He's not saying that everybody goes to hell here, but your testimony will perish. Your usefulness will perish. Because they received not the love of the truth. Where do you find that? It's right here. The Bible is truth. And if you love it, you have the love of the truth. Just keep it basic. <laughs> that they might be saved. That will save you from being deceived. Verse 11. God takes it very serious. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion, as if they didn't have enough already, that they should believe a lie, that they might be damned to believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. The deception of wickedness is, you'll like what God says you can't like. Talk to Eve. <laughs> That's how she was deceived. Now there's some things that are just taken for granted, that you know good is the opposite of evil. Evil is the opposite of good. <laughs> he says in the end times, this is what's going to happen, 2 Timothy 3.13. But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse. We're in the times that are at the end. Things are getting worse and worse by the day, by the moment, by the hour. Deceiving and being deceived. They're both a deceiver and they themselves are deceived by the devil and by God. We just read that if they don't love the truth, God gives them delusions. Okay, deceived and being deceived. Let's just go real simple, real simple stuff here. We're not going to make it complicated. Exodus twenty-two eighteen. Exodus twenty two eighteen. Thou shalt not suffer a witch to live. What's God's opinion of a witch? No good. You don't need a theology degree to know that. All you need is a Bible. Your eyeballs. <laughs> a heathen can tell you that. Okay, let's see what else he says. Deuteronomy 18, verse 9. Deuteronomy 18, verse 9. When thou art come into the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, thou shalt not learn to do after the abominations of those nations. God says, I'm setting up a nation that is different. When you get in here, this land I'm going to give you, you're different than those other nations. Don't learn about their things because they're wicked. Guess what? America is very similar to that. America is a Christian nation. We were founded on Christian principles. Now, we've strayed far from it as a nation, as a, a people group as whole, but we're still way ahead of the pack. There's many nations that have no idea about God. They weren't founded anywhere near God. You start following the garbage they're going to put out, knock that button off, <laughs> You start following the garbage they put out, and it'll be just like this. Abominations. Verse 10. There shall not be found among you. Okay, so he's saying, I know what those other nations were doing, and don't go follow them. Furthermore, I'm going to come down there and inspect, and when I do, I better not find any of this. <laughs> it's clear. Any... Uh, uh, among you, anyone that maketh his son or his daughter pass through the fire. Okay, don't be sacrificing your children. Don't burn them to Baal or to uh, Ashtoreth or, you know, any of the pagan gods. Don't be sacrificing, no human sacrifices. Well, we, we, I think we would agree with that. I mean, that seems just normal human reasoning. 
However, it's not so much for every other country. There's many countries who that's what they do. He says, I don't want to find that with you. Then he put this in there, the word or, or. Okay, so that's a clause. If we wanted to, we could read it this way. There shall not be found among you that useth divination. That's another thing he doesn't want found among you. Something else he doesn't want found among you. You know what divination is. Somebody's going to divine. They're going to forecast the future. An observer of times. That's your zodiacs, signs of the zodiac, whatever they call all that stuff that's in the newspaper. Um, or an enchanter, somebody who can cast spells. Or a witch. He said, I don't want to see that among you. Among you. He didn't say of you. Among you. Don't even have it among you, even if it's a stranger that walks in. Kick it out. Keep this mess clean. <laughs> you know he wanted a clean camp. Because he said, when, when I come down there, I'm going to come through and walk through your camp. And then he gave him a weird rule. He says, when you relieve yourself, make sure you cover it. Now that seems like a really odd rule. But he's saying, I walk through the midst of you, and I don't want to step on your mess. <laughs> That's what he's saying. Now, spiritually, the same way. He said, amongst my people, I don't want any of this witchcraft junk. It's got to go. Now, it's very subtle, the way the devil works. What he'll do in this day and age is he's got, he says over there in the New Testament, uh, we're not ignorant of his devices, the devil's devices. Today, that's how he gets you. A device, a tablet, a smartphone, a TV, some sort of a device. You got to watch those devices. It may start out seemingly innocent. And if you'll stay in the Bible and stay vigilant, you'll see when they begin to veer. Not all of them start out innocent. Many of them start out very bad from the beginning. I'm going to cover something that's tough. One of the hardest things a preacher has to do is confront wickedness. Because the people enjoy it. So, when a preacher has to confront it, he has to do it 100% because God says, go do it. Period. One thing that is a biggie that the devil is using right now is anime. I don't know how in the world an adult would say his favorite pastime is watching a cartoon. <laughs> an adult? Come on, give me a break. I heard a 25-year-old, <clears throat> that's all he could talk about. Now, you know where that junk comes from? Anime. You know where that junk comes from? It comes from China and Japan. Are they Christian nations? Do they know anything about Christ? No. Do you know what it all leads to? At some point, it either starts with or it leads to a god of their ancestors. Always. I'm going to pull out one that's very obvious and blatant. Kiki's Delivery Service. Now, rather than me read it, I'll tell you what, I'll let you hear how Wiki defines it. Traditional for trainee witches, 13-year-old Kiki leaves home with her familiar spirit, a talking black cat named Gigi. She flies on her broomstick to the port city of Coraco. While searching for somewhere to live, Kiki is pursued by Tombo, a geeky boy obsessed with aviation who admires her flying ability. Change for accommodation, Kiki helps Asano, the kindly and heavily pregnant owner of a bakery. She opens a witch delivery business, delivering goods by broomstick. Her first delivery goes badly. She is caught in a gust and loses the black cat toy she is supposed to deliver. Chichi pretends to be the toy until Kiki can retrieve the real item. She finds it in the home of a young painter, Ursula, who repairs and returns it to Kiki so she can complete the delivery and rescue Chichi. Accepts a party invitation from Tombo, but is delayed by her work and, exhausted, falls ill. When she recovers, Asano clandestinely arranges for Kiki to see Tombo again by assigning her a delivery address to him. 
After Kiki apologizes for missing the party, Tavo takes her for a test ride on the flying machine he is working on fashioned from a bicycle. Kiki warms to Tavo but is intimidated by his friends, and walks home. Becomes depressed and discovers she can no longer understand Gigi, who has befriended a pretty white cat. She has also lost her flying ability and is forced to suspend her delivery business. Kiki has a surprise visit from Ursula, who determines that Kiki's crisis is a form of artist's block. Ursula suggests that if Kiki can find a new purpose, she will regain her powers. Kiki is visiting a customer, she witnesses an airship accident on television which leaves Tombo hanging from one of the drifting vessel's mooring lines. Kiki regains her flying power and manages to rescue him. She regains her confidence, resumes her delivery service, and writes a letter home saying that she and Gigi are happy. Hot Topic and her universe present Studio Godly. Alright, that jumped too fast. Okay, that's Wiki's explanation of it. This is Google's explanation of it. Pretty much the same thing. I'm not going to read it to you. Uh, it's from the beginning. Wicked. A witch? A 13-year-old leaves home to go train for a year with a familiar spirit? Whew. That's wicked. It's sucking the kids in left and right. Yeah. So what do they do next? You need to advertise it. Halloween's coming up. Look out, there it is. Kiki. There she is. Here's the clothing lines sales pitch. Comes to animated films, there's just something about studio godly films that really capture that sense of magic and wonder. From the stunningly beautiful visuals to the fantastical stories, these films have won the hearts of many. One thing that was missing was the ability to wear this beautiful art. However, thanks to the efforts of her universe and Hot Topic, we can now enjoy a new clothing collection. Okay, so, clothes to stay away from. If you don't know what it means, don't put it on. Okay. Cat bus. Okay, that's, this is all related to one of two demon demonic shows. The um, neighbor something, something neighbor, or the Kiki show. Cat bus, Miss Witch, be my neighbor. Now that sounds innocent to you, but it doesn't to the people who are watching that mess. If they see you wear it, they, you've just identified as a satanic watcher. Let's see some more of their jump. Sometimes you just have to be who you are and not care what people think. Now that sounds like a good slogan, but see they've got Tombo or Kiki or whatever the goofball is, the cat, so you know that it's coming from that show. Here's some more. Miss Witch. Who in their right mind would wear something like that? Uh, you don't want to identify as a witch. There's that cat bus. A caged, this is this thing, the special delivery. That's how she got started in her witch delivery. See, if you just look at that shirt, I wouldn't know what that is. But the world out there is pushing that for a reason. And to them, they're watching this mess. They know what it means. And you've just identified yourself as part of something. Know what it is. All right, so that's all of Kiki's mess. Now, that came out in uh, 98, and it came out in America, uh, I think, eight years later. Um, so that's a relatively old one. Um, and I don't need to save all that mess. Okay, now we'll get back to our lesson. The anger of God. And we go from that to something happy. <laughs> Anger of God. Let's see, where did we stop last time? I think. Oh, I got this book in backwards. Probably is. Let's see. Yes. Okay, the anger of God. I guess I can just leave that up for y'all. 
The anger of God is not to be questioned. God can get angry, and we shouldn't be the ones to say, no, you can't. He's bigger than we are. <laughs> don't tell him no. <laughs> if he's already mad, don't push it. <laughs> For instance, we know what he thinks of these demonic things. And we know what he's already declared I'm going to do at the end. I'm going to pour out all of my wrath and destroy them. I'm going to melt them with a fervent heat is what he says. So let's not identify it with it. That's provoking him. Okay, we're not to question him. In Romans 9 verse 20. Romans 9 verse 20. He says, Nay, but, O man, who art thou that repliest against God? Shall the thing formed say to him that formed it, Why hast thou made me thus? We can't tell God why. That's a tough thing. Because there's things that are going to happen in your life. That's a question that's going to come up. Why? Why? Just know that he's taking care of it. Depend on him even stronger when you don't understand. Because he does understand. Look at verse 22. What if? Okay, here's a possible answer to it. What if God, willing to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction? He says sometimes what God does is he puts up with foolishness. You might say, the wicked are just attacking me every day. God, why? Haven't you taken them out already? Here's the answer. Maybe it's because those vessels are fitted to destruction. And what he's doing is he's building that sinner's account. He's allowing them to accrue more and more punishment. Because when he comes down, he's going to come down hard. He says maybe that's the reason for it. So don't go questioning because we think it's not on our level of fair. It'll, it'll work its way out. Um, the anger of God is manifest in terrors. This is a fact. Exodus 14, verse 24. Exodus 14, 24. Exodus 14, 24 says, And it came to pass that in the morning watch the Lord looked upon the host of the Egyptians through the pillar of fire and the cloud and troubled the host of the Egyptians. God's getting in on the action. <laughs> it's not enough that their chariot wheels are going to get stuck in the mud trying to come through there. It's not enough that he's going to collapse the wall of water that has been stacked up for Israel to pass through. That's not enough. He's got to trouble them. There's no telling what is encased in that word, troubled them. But that's something special he's doing. Psalm 76, verse 6. <coughs> Psalm 76, verse 6. At thy rebuke, O God of Jacob... Both the chariots and the horses are cast into, the, into a deep sleep. Okay, so imagine this. They're coming across there, and all of a sudden it's like they've been taking NyQuil. <laughs> they suddenly get real tired. Here's Pharaoh gung-ho to go get these you know, slaves that we've been stupid and let go. They're making it across there, and we're gaining on them. We can see them over there, and then all of a sudden... He just gets so sleepy, he can't hardly take it, and his horses are falling asleep. That's not the time to get drowsy. <laughs> I think his doctor probably has a fine print on there after that. Do not take this after, don't drive after taking this so many hours. <laughs> no more chariots. <laughs> Verse 7. Thou, even thou art to be feared. God intends to be feared. He intends to be scary. And who may stand in thy sight when once thou art angry? If God gets angry, things start exploding. Thou didst cause judgment to be heard from heaven. The earth feared and was still. Jeremiah 10.10 10. Jeremiah 10.10 10. But the Lord is the true God. He is the living God and an everlasting king. At his wrath, 
the earth shall tremble. We've not seen that yet. You'll find certain areas that get an earthquake or something. That ain't what he's talking about. He's talking about this whole globe shaking in its boots. The earth shall tremble, and nations shall not be able to abide his indignation. When he gets mad, it's bad. So let's not make him mad. So it's a good thing he's told us in the Bible what makes him mad so we can stay away from it. Um, it's manifest in afflictions. Sometimes a Christian gets these, but you can definitely see it in the lost world. In Job 21, 17. Job 21, 17. How oft is the candle of the wicked put out, and how oft cometh their destruction upon them? God distributeth sorrows in his anger. There's no peace to the wicked. Sorrow is what they find. In his presence, God's presence, is fullness of joy. The farther you get from his presence, the farther you get from joy. And you run right into sorrow. Psalm 78, 49. Psalm 78, 49. He cast upon them the fierceness of his anger. Wow, that sounds pretty mad. Fierceness of his anger. Fierceness sounds pretty bad. Anger sounds pretty bad. You put both those together and... Uh, I got somewhere else I need to be. <laughs> and indignation and trouble by sending uh oh evil angels among them. You want to start messing with the occult? The occult doesn't control the occult. God does. Verse fifty. He made a way to his anger. Hmm. Most of the time he's restraining himself. He's holding back his anger. Because we get to breathe another breath means he's not punished us for all the wickedness we've done, thought, and considered. He's holding it back. But there are times you can push his buttons where he says, enough, okay, here you go. He spared not their soul from death, but gave their life over to the pestilence and smote all the firstborn of Egypt, the chief of their strength in the tabernacles of Ham. Psalm 90, verse 7. Psalms 90, verse 7. For we are consumed by thine anger, and by thy wrath are we troubled. A lot of times that's the trouble we face. When you face trouble, the first place to go, the first place, is did I make you mad? Don't start with, um, this is a spiritual conflict, I'm fighting the devil. To start with, was it me? What happened when Jesus was at the Last Supper? He said, one of you is going to betray me. You know the immediate response? All of them turned to him and said, is it I? They didn't say, I bet it's Peter over there. <laughs> that Peter, he can't say anything. No. They said, is it me? Is it me? That's where we need to start. God, did I make you mad? Is this trouble something you're giving me to straighten me out? I want to recognize it immediately. Now, it's not always. But let's start there, because we could go through the others and deceive ourselves, and it still didn't fix the problem. <laughs> let's start with that one. If that one will fix it, good. Let's get that one done quick. Um, and then there's a bunch more verses. I'm not going to give you all of them. Uh, God's anger cannot be restrained. When he decides he's letting loose of his anger, you can't stop it. Job 9, verse 13. Resisted. I said restrained, didn't I? Job 9, 13. If God will not withdraw his anger, the proud helpers do stoop under him. So if God doesn't call back his wrath at some point, it's like watching a ball game and one team is just getting hammered. You know, it's no fun to watch a ball game when the score is 2 to 95. You know, <laughs> that's what he's saying here. If God doesn't restrain himself, if he doesn't pull back, He'll just beat you into smithereens. So the second you start to feel his anger, repent of it. <laughs> Get out from under it. Psalm 76, 7. Thou even thou art to be feared, and who may stand in thy sight when once thou art angry? Okay, if he gets mad, there's no standing before it. There's no standing up to it. 
there's no what's this man on man you know come down here and fight me like a man no 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 don't, don't get into that one Nehemiah 1 6 Nehemiah 1 6 he says who can stand before his indignation and who can abide the fierceness of his anger his fury is poured out like fire that's why hell is fire and the rocks are thrown down by him. That's why there are brimstone in hell. Fire and brimstone. That's the evidence of his anger. His full anger. We get little evidences of it here and there. But eventually, the heathen are going to feel the full force of his anger and wrath. It's aggravated. God's anger is aggravated by continual provoking. You can push him. If you don't straighten out, just like an animal, you tell the dog, sit down. And the dog's still running all over everything. Say, sit. Well, you're not suddenly going to say, okay, you win, go ahead, run, run all over. <laughs> no, you're going to suddenly become more and more harsh until the stupid idiot understands what sit means. <laughs> God's the same way. When we first feel his anger, begin. Submit to it. Don't resist it because it will get stronger. Numbers 32, 14. And behold, ye are risen up in your father's stead, an increase of sinful men to augment yet the fierce anger of the Lord toward Israel. He said, you're adding to it. You've just built it up even more. Your fathers were bad, but now you've just added to it. It's specially reserved for the day of wrath. That's the second advent when he pours out all of his wrath. On that day, you can count on it, all of the wrath of God will be on exhibition. Uh, there's a lot of verses for it. We'll just go to Romans 2, Romans 2, verse 5. He says, But after thy hardness and impenitent heart, treasurest up to thyself wrath against the day of wrath, and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. He said, when you do what you know you shouldn't be doing and you don't confess it and get rid of it and forsake it, what you've just done is you've increased your wrath account. You've treasured up like you're buying new stocks <laughs> and the, the, the stock market's rising. In 2 Thessalonians 1.8, he says, in flaming fire... I didn't know there was any other kind, but in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. One day there's going to be a day that God's not going to be merciful, be long-suffering, be patient with man. He is right now. Let's take advantage of it. There's coming a day where that will no longer be, and it's going to be flaming fire and vengeance on anybody who doesn't obey. Whew. Let's get the head start on it. Revelation eleven eighteen, And the nations were angry. Well, they're nothing. <laughs> and thy wrath is come, and the time of the dead, that they should be judged, and that thou shouldest give reward unto thy servants, the prophets, and to, uh, and to the saints, and to them that fear thy name, small and great, and shouldest destroy them which destroyed the earth. Okay? He's saying here, one day God's going to set the record straight. Anybody who was against the principles of God, anybody who was against God or his people, God's going to take vengeance. He's going to come out and repay. He says, if I've got to pull them up from the dead, you see that, time of the dead? If I've got to pull them up from the dead so they get to experience a full cup of my wrath, that's what I'll do. <clears throat> Don't be around for that. Revelation nineteen fifteen. Revelation nineteen fifteen. This is how he does it. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and that he should rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. He's going to pour out all of the wrath. He's the caretaker of it, of Almighty God. 
And he's going to rule these nations on earth for a thousand years with a rod of iron, a military dictatorship. I say military because all he has to do is say, uh, let's see you uh, combust, <laughs> spontaneous combustion, and you'll blow up on fire. He can wipe a person out just with the thought. Okay, so he's going to be ruling, a dictator ruling this earth. So the thing to do is learn how to uh, comply with his, law, his laws and his rules this, this side of the grave so that when you get in eternity, it's old hat. <laughs> you know what to do. There's going to be nations. That's going to be a hard lesson to learn. Um, it's against the wicked. That's the first place that the wrath of God falls. Now, it falls on Christians in varying degrees. However, on the wicked, you can count on it. They've got the wrath of God abiding on them now. They might not feel all of its effects yet, but it's on them. In Psalms 21, verse 9, he says, Thou shalt make them as a fiery oven in the time of, uh, in the time of thine anger. The Lord shall swallow them up in his wrath and the fire shall devour them there it is hellfire people have a problem with preachers being they call them hellfire damnation preachers how about hellfire and damnation book that's what it is it's all throughout there but hey we believe it to be a fact truth then it's better if I tell you on this side and you can avoid it in Isaiah 13 9 Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, cruel. This is Jesus Christ coming back. The day of the Lord cometh, and it's going to be cruel, both with wrath and fierce anger, to lay, to lay the land desolate, and he shall destroy the sinners thereof out of it. Wow. There's coming a day that he's going to reverse all of the things that are going on right now. Right now, it seems wickedness is ruling. Because by and large, the globe, the people, have decided the prince of the power of the air is their god. They follow Kiki and all the wickedness that they can find. All of the demonic shows. This is spirit of the age. It just draws them in, sucks them in. Well, one day, God's going to come down here and he's going to fix it. He's going to wipe out all the wickedness. And then it's going to reverse it will be just as strong as people are attracted to wickedness, they'll be attracted to righteousness. Now, that'll be a good day. But until then, we've got to fight upstream. In uh, Romans 1.18, Romans 1.18, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness. So we can work on that for a lifetime. Find out how to be godly and continue to be more and more godly. Because if you go the other direction, you get wrath. And ungodliness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. They've got the truth. They just pervert it. Look at uh, chapter 2, verse 8. But unto them that are contentious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation and wrath. Oof. God says, I've laid down the rules and the principles. And you know what a miracle it is to have this book in our hands. It's been preserved over 6,000 years. And we're still holding it and reading the rules and the principles from heaven, from God. Okay, he didn't have to go to all that work. He could have just zapped a few people and said, well, maybe they'll learn in a minute. Zap. Can you figure that one out? No, they still hadn't got it. I'm going to zap a few more. <laughs> he doesn't do it that way. He tells you on the front end, here's what makes me mad, and here's what happens when I get mad. <laughs> very, very, um, very logical. Yes, he tells you exactly everything. Yes, all, all the cards are face up. Do it. Full disclosure. Colossians 3, verse 6. He says, for which things sake... The wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience. It's all disobedience, disobedience. That's rebellion and disobedience is always connected to the wrath of God falling quickly. It always 
comes right on the heels of that. So if you feel within yourself that you're becoming rebellious, don't. I'll tell you a, a quick one. Um, we were at Marcus Point, and they wanted us to do the third or fourth installment of um, Heretic Warren, <laughs> Rick Warren, <laughs> one of his things. And immediately, my flesh jumped in the, in the scene, and it said, oh, okay, I'm not doing that. I'm going to do them. And I said, wait a minute. <laughs> Am I just being rebellious? Because rebellious is bad. Flesh will get rebellious and give you a spiritual reason to do it. I said, okay, no. Okay, God, you want me to do it? We'll do it. I'll just see what you say about it. Okay, you kick down rebellion. Kick it down. You can feel that spirit rise up in you. Go against it. Go against it because his wrath is soon to fall. Um, his wrath is against those that forsake him. Now, this is a dangerous thing that's going on right now. I'm seeing people getting picked off left and right and left and right. And not weak people, strong people getting picked off. You've got to follow him close and you've got to be observant. The second you show any weakness, the devil's going to capitalize on it stronger than he has in any other age. In Isaiah 1 verse 4, he says, Ah, sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, a seed of evildoers, children that are corruptors. How is all that possible? I saw, I read a great article on punctuation. I get the greatest kick out of the most dry, boring stuff. <laughs> it was talking about the colon. The colon tells you, stop, I'm going to give you more information about what you just read. So the more information about what we just read is, they have forsaken the Lord. Forsake the Lord, and this is what follows, a sinful nation, people laden with iniquity, seed of evildoers, and corruptors. Those are all the result of people who have forsaken the Lord. They have provoked, uh-oh, the Holy One of Israel unto anger. They're gone away backward. They were close, and now they ain't, and soon they won't be no more. <laughs> it's also levied against unbelief, the anger of God is. In Psalm 78, 21, he says, Therefore the Lord heard this and was wroth. So a fire was kindled against Jacob, it and anger also came up against Israel because they believed not in God and trusted not in his salvation. There's a million ways you can take that. The most simple, basic thing is you need his salvation for eternity. You need it. The only way to get it is to believe in Jesus Christ's payment was enough for you and quit trying to make any other payment any other way. That'll give you salvation for eternity. But you need salvation on a day-to-day -day basis. You need salvation on, oh, I just, I just did something stupid. That's going to make God mad. Okay, how do you rectify it? You need salvation from that, don't you? Okay, find out what he says. God is so good, he doesn't just say, this is what I don't want you to do. He says, if you do that, just tell me. We'll wipe it out as though it didn't happen. I wouldn't have done that. But he does. That's a pretty good deal. Better take advantage of it. It's also levied against apostasy. In Hebrews 10, 26, he says, For if we sin willfully, after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation, which shall devour the, deceit, the adversaries. Willful sin. We've all been there. Matter of fact, every time you sin, it's a willful sin. You willed it. Especially in America. Nobody put a gun to your head and forced you to do anything wicked. You chose it. There's a way you could have done righteousness in any situation in America. Now, I don't know about some of those foreign countries where they are literally in China right now. They are going after the Christians like never before. Um, now there it may be different but here any sin you sin is willful you chose it and he says what happens with willful sin is fiery indignation so get it wiped out so 
it's like it never existed. Confess your sin, he'll forgive it. That simple. Now, not just that simple. You have to repent and determine not to do it again. It's also against idolatry. This is a big one. And this is where a lot of that device, wicked devices, come in. Um, Disney's become very bad about this. Their shows are all hearkening back to some idol, some worship of a false god. Watch them. Uh, don't, don't watch them, but watch them. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> Disney's gone crazy with that stuff. Um, idolatry. Now, you would think in America, 2018 or whatever year it is, we wouldn't be talking about idolatry, but we are. It was a problem in the Old Testament, and it's going to be a great problem in the tribulation. In Deuteronomy 29, 20, it says, The Lord will not spare him, but then the anger of the Lord and his jealousy shall smoke against that man, and all the curses that are written in, the book, uh, in this book shall lie upon him, and the Lord shall blot out his name from under heaven. Mm. Idolatry makes him especially mad. Um, and there's just hundreds of verses on it. Um, I'll just give you one more. Jeremiah 44, 3. He said, Because of their wickedness, which they have committed to provoke me to anger, in that they went to burn incense and to serve other gods whom they knew not, neither they, yea, nor their fathers. That's that following a god of some other nation. He said, You didn't grow up under this. You're seeking out wickedness. That's idolatry to him. He said, I levy anger at that. It's against sin in saints. Um, after you're saved, you can still experience the anger of God and his wrath by committing sin. That's why a Christian, more than the lost world, is a professional repenter. Hundreds of times a day we should be repenting. And that's no exaggeration. Psalms 89, verse 30, he said, If his child forsake my law and walk not in my judgments, if they break my statutes and keep not my commandments, then will I visit their transgressions with the rod and their iniquity with stripes. Now, that's still bad, but it's sure not as bad as burning them up and consuming them and <laughs> throwing down hot ash on them. And, but he says he's going to correct it. So even in a Christian, we don't escape correction. Just because the lost world has the heavy-duty wrath coming after them doesn't mean we're not going to experience some for our own sins. We will. In Psalms 102, verse 9, For I have eaten ashes like bread and mingled my drink with weeping. It's David. He's being corrected by God. Verse 10, Because of thine indignation and thy wrath, for thou hast lifted me up and cast me down. God will correct his children. Matter of fact, you're probably going to correct your own children faster than you correct somebody else's. When I was growing up, any adult could correct you. And they did. Only, I wasn't so stupid. I learned to be good real quick, at least outwardly. Um, because anybody and everybody was watching. <laughs> It's the same with God. God's probably going to correct you faster than the lost world. You look around and see the heathen getting away with stuff. Don't think they're getting away with it. They're not getting away with it. And the second you start to do something wicked, he smacks you and you're in timeout. Timeout. Wouldn't that be nice? <laughs> but that's because you're his. He didn't want his getting in that same mess the world's in. It's extreme against those who oppose God. If you're going to be anti-God, count on him showing up to show he's really God. <laughs> he's going to prove it to you. Psalms 2, verse 2. The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. Verse 5. Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. Don't decide that you're more powerful than God. That's a wrestling match you don't want to have. 1 Thessalonians 2.16 He says, uh, Forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles that they might be saved. This is what the Jews have been doing. 
to fill up their sins always, for the wrath is come upon them to the uttermost. Israel is going to face the 70th week of Daniel's 70 weeks that you read about in Daniel chapter 9. It's going to come on them. That's what we call the tribulation. And it's due to the rebellion. Don't be anti-God. Even his children, the nation of Israel, turned anti-God. They started inventing their own God. Now, you can become anti-God with a Bible in your hand. You can become anti-God going to church. Just invent your own. Don't follow the one that's in here. Make up one. That's why I'm trying to give you the full counsel of God. I'm not just coming up here trying to tell you all the nice, sweet things that you want to hear. I want to give you everything. So I'm sure I'm giving you who God is, not who I imagine him to be. Your imagination, God, and the real one, if they don't match, you'll meet the real one. Um, and we probably better stop there. I don't know how long we've gone. Yeah, or we've gone now.